welcome to the experience economy. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me tell you about a particular offering that I think is very telling. Let me know if you've ever seen this particular offering before. Right? If you haven't seen these, what happens is a kid comes up to the gumball wizard, as it's called, puts his quarter in the slot, turns the crank, and then doesn't get a gumball. At least not right away. Instead, he gets this gumball spiraling experience. It goes clickety-clack as it goes. Now, there's no functional purpose whatsoever for this device. You don't get a better manufactured good. The gumball's the same as it's always been. You don't get better service. In fact, you can say the service is actually worse. Why? Right, it takes longer to get the gumball that you requested. And yet, it has more value. It has more value because of the experience. I've seen kids go up to their parents, ask them for a quarter, excitedly come up to the gumball wizard, put their quarter in the slot, turn the crank, have that gumball spiraling experience, pick up that gumball, throw it away, and go ask their parents for another quarter. <laughs> it's really just a slot machine for kids is what it is. <laughs> but why do we see offerings like this? Well, it's because of a very fundamental change in the very fabric of the economy. We've gone from an agrarian economy based off commodities through an industrial economy based off goods to a service economy. And what happened in the service economy is that goods became commoditized. Commoditized, meaning they're treated like a commodity, where people don't care who makes them, they don't care about the brand, they are about the features, they're all pretty much the same anyway. They care about three things and three things only. Price, price, and price. That's when goods have been commoditized. And in fact, the internet is the greatest force of commoditization ever invented. The frictionless marketplace means that customers can instantly compare prices from one vendor to another, and it tends to push them down to the lowest possible price. But increasingly, we see services being commoditized as well. Long-distance telephone service today sold on price, price, price. Fast food restaurants with all their value pricing and the internet can even commoditize services. If you look at financial services, what used to cost several hundred dollars to buy or sell a block of shares with a full service broker, can now cost as low as $3 with an internet-based broker. What that means is that goods and services are no longer enough. Goods and services are everywhere becoming mere commodities. So it's time to move to a new level of economic value, to go beyond the goods and services to staging experiences. Now, the most important thing to understand in this framework is that experiences are a distinct economic offering, as distinct from services as services are from goods. It's basically when you use goods as props and services as the stage to engage each and every person in an inherently personal way and thereby create a memory which is the hallmark of the experience. So we're shifting into an experience economy where experiences are becoming the predominant economic offering, where experiences are what people want today. Experiences are the source of growth and jobs and GDP. And the patient experience, the family experience, the caregiver experience, that's what we need to focus on in healthcare. We need to innovate in today's experience economy in experiences. That hit home for me a number of years ago when I was in Milan, Italy. And I was giving this boardroom presentation with a number of different companies. Uh, and one executive was a vice president of Maxwell House in Europe. And he said something that amazed me. He said, you know, there's been no innovation in the coffee industry in 15 years. And I said, are you kidding me? Have you never heard of Starbucks? Because <laughs> for him, innovation wasn't goods. Like he had blinders on. They're manufacturing innovating goods, totally missing. The innovation in the coffee drinking experience that Howard Schultz created at Starbucks. The irony, of course, being it was actually Milan, Italy, that inspired Howard Schultz to create that coffee culture here in the East, create places where people could enjoy a cup of coffee. Now, contrast what Maxwell House did or didn't do with Nestle. When Nestle was faced with Starbucks increasingly controlling coffee consumption in the world, what did they do is they innovated. With the Nespresso brand, they innovated this capsule system where you could brew your own particular individual cup of coffee. So that the best cafe was your cafe in your own home. And they innovated the Nespresso machine. Now, yes, this is a physical good but they made the design of it so engaging that just using the espresso machine is an experience. And then they created their own experience places, the Nespresso boutiques, where you can go in, learn about the Nespresso machine, have them make a cup of coffee just for you. Understand the basic principle that if you get your customers to experience your offering before they buy it, the chances they will buy it go up. 
They innovated in services as well with an espresso club where you get your particular capsules automatically replenished just for you. And that's another basic principle of the experience economy, that if you're staging experiences, it just doesn't hurt if George Clooney is your spokesperson. <laughs> now, if you think about coffee, coffee perfectly exemplifies this progression of economic value I'm talking about. Because coffee at its core is what? Right? Beans, right? It's a commodity. You know it's a commodity. You can actually look up the future price of coffee in the Wall Street Journal every morning. And if you convert it from a per bushel, bushel to a per cup basis, you know how much coffee costs per cup when you treat it as a commodity? Two or three cents. That's how much a coffee, cup of coffee is worth in beans. But if you take those beans, you roast them, grind them, package them, put them on a grocery store shelf like Maxwell House does, now you get five, 10, 15 cents per cup of coffee. Perform the service of actually brewing it for a customer in a vending machine, a kiosk, a corner diner somewhere, and now you can get 50 cents, a dollar, a dollar and a half per cup of coffee but surround the brewing of that coffee with the ambiance in the theater of a Starbucks, and now how much are you paying, right? Up to five or even more dollars per cup of coffee with only two or three cents worth of beans in it, right? So one industry with four distinct levels of value, all dependent on what business they think that they are in. And recognize that you are what you charge for. You are what you charge for. If you charge for undifferentiated stuff, you're in the commodities business. If you charge for tangible things, you're in the goods business. If you charge for the activities your people perform, fees for service, then you're in the service business. But you're in the experience business economically if and only if you charge for time. The time your customers spend with you. Now, what happens in any one of these economic shifts is people always give away the next level of value in order to better, char better sell what they have today. So Starbucks, for example, just charges a premium for the coffee. It doesn't charge for the time you spend in the place. But eventually, we have to align what we charge for with what our customers value. And that means charging for time, be it a mission fee or a membership fee of some sort. And there are, in fact, cafes that do that. There's a chain of cafes in the UK, Zifferblatt Cafe, where they charge six pence per minute. The coffee is free, the pastries are free, they're subsumed into the experience, recognizing that by charging an admission. Or have you ever been to an American girl place? You know, the average person walking through those doors doesn't leave for over two hours. Right? Why? Because of the experiences they have inside, the original theater they had in the original stores, the cafe where they're charging admission for lunch or tea or dinner, the doll hospital, the hair salon, the photo shoot. You can go into American Girl Place and spend hundreds of dollars without buying a thing, right? just for the admission feed experience. Wingtip is a men's store in Sa San Francisco uh, founded by Ami Arad, who calls it Solutions for the Modern Gentleman. And as he was creating Wingtip, he read the experience economy, got to that page in chapter three where we asked the question, what would you do differently if you charged admission? His solution, he created a club. Several floors above the uh, men's store where he charges $200 per month for an amazing membership experience. So the club generates demand for the men's store and the men's store generates demand for the club. So in the same way, we in healthcare need to think about what would we do differently if we charged a membership fee? What experience would be of so much value that our patients and or their family members would be willing to pay us out of our own pockets just to belong? But we can't stop there. We have to go beyond the experience because experiences can, in fact, be commoditized as well. In fact, experiences may be the easiest economic offering to commoditize because the second time you have an experience doesn't tend to be as good as the first. The third time, not as good as that, and pretty soon customers are saying, been there, done that. That's the hallmark of a commoditized experience. But what happens when you design an experience that is so appropriate for this particular person, that's exactly the experience that they need at this moment in time? Then you can't help but turn it into what we often call a life-transforming experience. In other words, an experience that changes us in some way. And that I call a transformation. And transformations are the fifth and final economic offering in this progression of economic value. We're using experiences as the raw material to guide customers to change. In business schools, for example, the former dean of the London Business School, John Quelch, once told Fast Company Magazine that we're not in the education business, we're in the transformation business. 
We expect everyone who participates in the program at the London Business School, whether it's for three days or for two years, to be transformed by the experience. That's a different mindset. That's a different economic offering. GlaxoSmithKline makes these physical products, right? Nicorette gum, Nicoderm CQ patches, and everyone who buys these goods wants to be transformed. From what to what? Right, from smoker to non-smoker. But they did a study and found that only 24% of the people who buy their products ever achieve that aspiration. So they put together a program, a transformational program called Committed Quitters, where they talk to everyone up front. They understand why they want to quit. When do they most crave, crave a cigarette? Uh, what are the obstacles to stop smoking? And then they design an eight-week program around the gum or the patch. And then people have a 50% greater likelihood of quitting smoking, of achieving that aspiration, because they view it transformationally. Think about the insurance industry. I think insurance is a lot like healthcare. I mean, nobody wants to have an accident. But when they do, Progressive comes to their rescue with these immediate response claims vehicles. And the CEO told Fast Company Magazine that we're not in the business of auto insurance. We're in the business of reducing the human trauma and economic costs of automobile accidents right, in effective and profitable ways. That, again, is a transformational view. That's what business they are really in. It's all about achieving aspirations. Right? It's about that from to statement. Where are your patients today? What do they want to become? And how do you help them achieve those aspirations? I like to think of it as a transformation has three distinct phases. The first phase is diagnosis. And by diagnosis, I don't just mean medical diagnosis. I mean whole person diagnosis. Who is this person as an individual human being? What are their aspirations for their health, for wellness, for their life? And then how do we design generally not one life transforming experience, generally a set of experiences that is going to take them along the path to be able to achieve their aspirations? And again, these are not the things we do to them. They're the things we do with them, the experiences they need to undergo to achieve their aspiration. But then we're not done. Once they get to that summit, we've got to have follow through. Not follow up, which is, hi, how you doing? But follow through, which is ensuring that the transformation takes hold, that is sustained through time. That's what it takes to truly be in the transformation business. And again, you are what you charge for. With experiences, we want to charge for time via membership fee. With transformations, what do we charge for? We charge for outcomes for the demonstrated outcomes that our customers, our patients, achieve. And that's why, in fact, the patient experience is so important today. Because research shows that the better the patient experience, the better the outcome. With a great patient experience, the chances that somebody heals goes up, the time it takes to heal goes down. And that's what healthcare is really about. It is about that outcome. So like any industry, we need to align what we charge for with what our customers value. And that means charging for that demonstrated outcome. So for example, in Copenhagen, Dare2 is a consulting company that created the Dare2 mansion where they have a membership fee for clients to come and spend time with Dare2 and with each other. But then they, with projects, they have a transformation guarantee. With 25% of their fees are based on did Dare2 do what they said they were going to do? Did the client get the outcome that they wanted. So to use Benjamin Franklin's famous formulation, any industry that is about helping people become healthy, wealthy, and wise is already shifting into outcome-based competition. And isn't healthcare all three? As Ralph Waldo Emerson taught us, health is the first wealth. If people don't have their health, the chances they ever can become prosperous are practically zero. And in today's time, do we not need wisdom in order to live life well? So to close, we need to go beyond fee for services. We need to start creating economic experiences that our patients value, for which we charge a membership fee, and beyond that to guiding transformations where we charge for the demonstrated outcome our patients achieve. For there is no greater value you can provide in this world than to help people achieve their health, 
wellness, and life aspirations. Thank you. Thank you.